record if that's okay uh, dr mens we usually upload these uh, videos on uh, the yale international website thanks karthik i'm recording here oh you are already okay apologies uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to invite uh, dr gary mens today uh, to uh, speak at our international conference uh, dr gary mens he's a senior medical advisor at the cardiovascular research foundation in new york and uh, a director of transcatheter cardiovascular mm -hmm. therapeutics that's tct He's the author of over a thousand uh, peer-reviewed peer articles. Uh, he's also written a, a seminal textbook on intravascular uh, ultrasound, uh, and he's a world authority and a pioneer of uh, intracoronary imaging. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Mintz. Uh, again, thank you so much for uh, taking time out to talk to our uh, forum here. Sure, thank you for the invitation. You should be able to see my screen. Yes, we do. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the value of intravascular imaging guided PCI. I'm not going to, this is not going to be a super practical talk. It's going to review what I think is the seminal literature. These are my disclosures. So as of this month, there are 24 randomized trial publications, 34 meta analyses, and 80 registries comparing intravascular imaging to angiographic guided DES implantation. IVIS is in white, OCT is in blue, and uh, papers with both IVIS and OCT are in yellow. So anybody who thinks that there isn't much data hasn't looked at the literature. But most of these studies, as well as studies of intracoronary physiology, have used composite endpoints. Instead, let's focus on something unambiguous and fundamental. Let's start mortality. So these are major meta-analyses combining randomized trials and non-randomized trial registries of IVIS versus angiographic guided DES implantation. And this is death. And you can see that regardless of the study, there's a reduction in mortality by somewhere in greater than 35%. And if you look at just meta-analyses of randomized trials, you can see that the mortality advantage of IVIS guidance increases to approximately 50%. This is one of these meta-analyses was published a couple of years ago in Circulation Journal, which is the Japanese journal. And you can see that IVIS guidance reduced cardiac mortality by 56%, as well as reducing MI, TLR, and stent thrombosis. The two largest studies are, of course, IVIS XPL and Ultimate. These are the initial publications. We now have five-year follow-up data from XPL and three-year follow-up data from Ultimate showing that the benefit of IVIS guidance is maintained and in fact increases from one to either five or three years, depending on the study. But we have integrated the patient level data from these two studies, meaning that we have between 2,500 and 3,000 patients with their primary data. And this is impressed in Jack intervention, showing that IVIS guidance reduced cardiac mortality by 57%. And if you met the IVIS optimization criteria in these two studies, the annual cardiac mortality rate was 0.15%. Now, early studies showed discrepancies between IVIS and OCT measurements. However, more recent studies show that HD IVIS and OCT measurements are more similar than different. This is the original OPUS class study that showed that 40 megahertz IVIS measured larger than OCT. But now we have recent HD IVIS data and quite frankly, people should be using high definition rather than old fashioned IVIS. And you can see that the measurements are almost identical in this paper from Fernando Alfonso's group and this paper from Stanford University, where the difference between the IVIS and OCT versus a phantom 
was only about 4%. And the difference in absolute measurements was you know, less than 0.1 millimeters. So we can start using, think about these two measurement technologies interchangeably. And at least our group has gravitated to a universal stent sizing algorithm where you size the stent to the distal reference, you size the post dilating balloon to the proximal reference, you do iterative, iving, iterative imaging to make sure that the, that the um, target stent expansion has been achieved and that you don't have geographic miss. And then you repeat um, adjunct inflations as necessary and until you are done with iterative imaging after each step. What about comparing IVIS versus OCT? There isn't a lot. These are meta-analyses of IVIS versus OCT looking at all cause and cardiovascular mortality. And you can essentially see that there's no difference between the two. Two recent um, abstracts presented at TCT showed identical mortality. And this is one of them. You can see that all cause mortality comparing OCT and IVIS doesn't favor either of the two. In addition, MACE, MI, stent thrombosis, and TLR does not favor either of the two technologies. Now, how do you define stent optimization? Stent optimization is defined by adequate expansion and no geographic miss. Adequate expansion is number one by far. These are all the publications that have identified under expansion as a cause of events. These are the studies that have identified geographic miss as a cause of the events. And these other minor issues like malaposition, eccentricity, longer lengths, and protrusion really do not factor into this at all. So let me ask a question. I obviously can't take a show of hands. This is a theoretical compliance chart that I pulled off the web comparing stent diameters pressures and the minimal stent area. And I simply ask you, what do you think is the expected stent diameter after implanting a three millimeter stent at 16 atmospheres? And let's make a multiple choice. And here are some um, examples of uh, expected stent minimal diameters. Well, the answer is 2.43 which means you can't use that little compliance chart on the outside of your box to improve stent expansion criteria and to optimize the procedure. And we've done this experiment at least four times. And on average, you achieve 75% of the predicted diameter and 67% or two thirds of the predicted area. You simply cannot get predictable stent expansion using angiography alone. So here's a clinical example. You can see it's, there's an impella in the left ventricle. Here is the final result after implanting a stent in the proximal LAD. Not bad, except if you do the IVUS pullback, you see that the stent is barely larger than the IVUS catheter in a ring of circumferential calcium. Now we have known going back to 1995, in this case, a study of over a thousand patients, that angiography is very limited in assessing calcification. We repeated this study using both IVIS and OCT in a smaller number of 440 patients, but the findings a couple of years ago, as opposed to 1995, are virtually identical. IVIS can look at the arc and the length, OCT can look at the arc length, thickness, area, and volume. And we've published now two calcium scores, one for OCT based upon maximum calcium angle, maximum calcium thickness, and calcium length. And most recently, an IVIS calcium score based upon the length of superficial calcium more than 270 degrees, the presence of a calcified nodule, vessel diameter, and the presence of circumferential calcium.
So let's look at um, uh, the issue for a moment of calcified nodules. Uh, everybody knows that this is the third most common cause of an acute coronary syndrome. The pathologists pat themselves on the back that they discovered this, but the reality is we published it way before the pathologists did in 1996, three cases of calcified nodules. Here's a, a classic example, a 45-year-old male, chronic renal failure on hemodialysis with other risk factors such as type 1 diabetes, hypertension, and smoking. Here is the angiogram with a fixed lesion in the right. The IVUS pullback, you see circumferential calcium. You see calcium length more than 20 millimeters. You see a calcified nodule, and it's a pretty big sized vessel. So in terms of um, calcium score, you've got one, two, three. And so when a stent was implanted with a pretty decent angiographic result, stent expansion was only 45%. Predictable based upon this newly published calcium score. Well, patient went home, two months later, back with restenosis, and notice that the calcified nodule has broken through the stent and is now protruding into the lumen, presumably because of um, calcified nodule induced stent fracture. This is treated with a drug coated balloon. Again, a pretty good, in this case, OCT and angiographic result. But two months later, back again. The lesion is worse with more length. Again, it's broken through the stent into the stent into the lumen. Um, the mechanism is stent fracture. Another stent was in place, was implanted. Great angiographic result, great OCT result. One month later, it's back. So here's some data. This is um, heavily calcified lesions comparing IVUS calcified nodule versus no calcified nodule. And you can see a trend for uh, more cardiac deaths in patients with calcified nodules. And this is acute coronary syndromes with calcified nodules compared to acute coronary syndromes without calcified nodules. Granted, calcified nodules are the minority with about 5%, which is pretty typical. Uh, the predictors are also pretty standard, including hemodialysis. The recurrence is high, and the mechanism of instant restenosis is just as I showed you on the case examples, a reintrusion of the calcified nodule because of stent fracture with only a minor component of neointimal hyperplasia. So we, just like we have a stent sizing algorithm, we have a stent calcium um, uh, modification algorithm based upon the IVIS and the OCT scores that I just showed you. And we look to demonstrate calcium fracture based upon plaque modification. And once we see calcium fracture, we proceed to stent implantation based upon the sizing algorithm that I've already showed you. Let's talk about some patient and lesion subsets. This is a study from Samsung Medical Center in Seoul, Korea, looking again at mortality, cardiac mortality at 10 years, reduced by IVIS guidance. And it doesn't matter what the patient subset is, or almost doesn't matter what the lesion subset is, IVIS guidance reduces cardiac mortality at 10 years of follow-up. There isn't a single example that favors angiography. Let's talk about left main disease. These are two review articles about imaging guided left main stenting as well as left main uh, severity evaluation. This is a meta-analysis from Escaned's group comparing FFR and IVIS assessment of left main severity with deferral on the FF, based on FFR more than 0.8 and an IVIS MLA of six square millimeters, and the mor annual mortality, if you defer, is identical between the two groups. There are, are now 17 studies, including two randomized trials, comparing angiographic versus IVIS-guided stent implantation for left main disease. 
and you can see a reduction in all-cause mortality by about 45% and cardiovascular mortality up to 61% uh, with IVIS guidance. And this is one of these meta-analyses showing that IVIS guided left main stent implantation reduced all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, as well as stem thrombosis, MI, and TLR. The most impressive and largest is the BESIS registry. This is a national UK registry showing that IVIS guided stent implantation for left main disease has a national nationwide reduction in mortality by 34%. And the operators with the greatest left main PCI volumes had the best outcomes and the best mortality benefit with IVIS guidance. And if you talk about the quartile of operators where the highest number of left main procedures, there was a 59% mortality benefit. This was just published in CERC Intervention. This is the main compare registry from Assam Medical Center in Korea. And they now have 10 year data supporting their earlier three year um, mortality data that was published several years ago also in CERC intervention. But you now see a 50% reduction in mortality with IVIS guided um, left main stent implantation. Uh, we're seeing this, this is a consistent number, this halving of mortality with image guided stent implantation. Also in Excel, we begin to recognize the importance of acute stent deformation, which was first published in 2011 and 2012, and was seen in about six to 7% of Excel patients. This is a clinical example, pre-intervention, post-stenting, in which case, where the IVIS pullback showed some stent under expansion in the distal left main, as well as the ostium of the LAD, followed by final kissing balloon inflations, final angiographic result. And unfortunately, you can see now where there was one layer of stents here, there are now two layers of stents and a reduction in the minimal stent area, indicating stent deformation. And then comparing deformation for no deformation, a strong trend, a um, reduction in cardiac mortality by two thirds um, compared to the absence of deformation. What about um, acute coronary syndromes? There are two large registries from Korea showing that imaging guidance reduced patient oriented and device oriented cardiac events because of a reduction in all cause and cardiac mortality. This in the Kamir registry and there's a paper that just appeared online from Jack Intervention, the Korea AMI registry, again showing a reduction in cardiac mortality um, at four years after uh, stenting for uh, um, uh, for a STEMI. What about CTOs? I'm not going to go into much detail. This excellent review article by Fred Glassy. Um, shows all the things that you can use IVIS to do to improve your CTO procedure, including identifying and crossing an ambiguous proximal cap, connecting the proximal and distal true lumens, assuring that the distal stent is implanted into the true lumen, identification of complications, and stent optimization. And there's one randomized trial showing that whether you lose intention to treat or per protocol, there's a reduction in, we don't have pure mortality benefit, but we have cardiac death MI uh, benefit with IVIS guidance by 75% and intention to treat and 80% per protocol. The last subset I wanna to touch on is patients presented with contrast induced nephropathy. If a patient presents with chronic kidney disease and develops contrast nephropathy, the mortality at one year can be as high as 25% and is entirely related to the amount of contrast used. Ziad Ali from our group has pioneered the concept of zero contrast PCI in these patients. And this is now a routine part of the armamentarium of the cath lab at Columbia University, as well as at St. Francis.
you simply do your piece, you do the diagnostic angiogram, you send the patient home for a week, you bring them back, hopefully their creatinine has not bumped because you've done a minimal contrast diagnostic study and everything is done without contrast afterwards using the roadmap from the initial diagnostic procedure um, and using um, uh, intracoronary physiology as necessary to confirm the IVIS result. So when people say, my patients do great, I don't need imaging guidance. Well, this is, these are three recent studies, 2020 and 2021, Onyx 1, the CATH PCI registry, and FAME 3. And if you look at the event rate, at one year, it, it is about 15%, and at four years, it's about 12%. Uh, so your patients really are not doing as well as you think they are. And I'm often asked by people who say they understand how imaging guidance reduces stent thrombosis and restenosis, but how does imaging guidance reduce mortality? And the answer is very simple. Stent thrombosis and DS restenosis are not benign events. Let me address two studies. This is from Castrati's group, 166 left main PCIs presented with instant restenosis, five-year mortality, 6%. CATH PCI registry, 66,000 patients with instant restenosis, four-year mortality, 28%. longer. And here are these two, those two studies I mentioned. This is the study from Castrati's group. Um, and this is the CAF PCI registry. On top of that, the iOpen ISR registry from the Washington Hospital Center compared IVIS guided versus angiographic guided instant restenosis treatment. And you can see at three years, the all-cause mortality is reduced from 16% to 11% with IVIS-guided treatment of instant restenosis. So when patients undergoing PCI, imaging guidance reduces mortality after stent implantation in almost every clinical scenario. We follow the data. This is the data from Columbia University Medical Center in 2019 which is the most recent data that they have available. 9% of PCIs are guided by either IVIS or OCT. And of course, we also used physiology. I talked purely about stent implantation. There are many other uses of imaging and physiology, including assessing lesion severity, identifying culprit lesions or vulnerable plaques, details of specific lesion subsets, and of course, how you assess stent failure. How do we do this? How do we incorporate all of these fairly standard, clinically available, you know, off the shelf imaging tools? We have a dedicated cath lab based imaging program with a director, dedicated technicians and fellows, standards, acquisition protocols, and of course we generate reports and we keep track of the data. How can you learn? You can visit a busy cath lab to see how it integrates imaging into clinical practice. You can attend courses and live case demonstrations. Very importantly, you can review studies more than once. Every time I look at a study, and I've been doing this a long time, I see something I did not see the first time I looked at the imaging run. You can show cases and weekly cath conferences. And of course, nothing substitutes for doing more cases and learning by doing. Thank you for your attention. Hey, Gary, it's Steve Fow. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a great review. I have a question about calcium, though. You um, kind of very clearly made the case that uh, we underestimate calcium by angiography, and, and imaging shows us how badly we underestimate it. Um, and 
that um, fracture we know can help with stent expansion. Is there data specifically in calcified lesions that um, you know increased stent expansion results in reduced mortality? And the reason I ask that is, you know, these large studies include both calcified and non-calcified lesions. And I think the data is clear that in those things that are more straightforward, less calcified, better expansion is, results in better outcomes. But specifically in severely calcified lesions, does the same rule apply that the greater expansion and the better uh, imaging results results in better outcome? I mean, there is no specific study in calcified lesions. Um, but I can't imagine that you could say, well, achieving better stent expansion in simple lesions is great, but under expansion and calcified lesions is okay. I, I, I just can't imagine that. I will accept the fact, because I think we can document that calcified lesions in and of themselves have a higher um, event rate, both coronary and quite frankly, non-coronary. Coronary calcification is a marker for non-cardiac Mort causes of mortality. Um, and so I would imagine that the mortality be would be greater in, um, in well-expanded and not well-expanded calcified lesions. Um, but it still should be better if you get adequate stent expansion. I can't imagine not yeah, well, I just think that, you know, sometimes the trauma that we have to induce in that artery to get good extent expansion between atherectomy or, or shockwave or both or laser um, is such that, uh, you know, healing from that trauma is, uh, you know, it's, it's, is, can it's overcome possible. the benefit. Yeah, it's possible. It's certainly that calcified arteries are a marker for just bad outcomes in general. Those patients are different, in my opinion. Oh, um, no, no, you're absolutely right. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about PCI, cabbage, whether you're talking about acute coronary syndrome, um, and quite any talk about, um, I mean, I've, I don't have a whole talk on calcium, and I've summarized the, um, the outcomes, the non-cardiac outcomes, kidney disease, lung disease, cancer, everything is higher in patients with a lot of coronary calcium. Yeah, that's why I just wondered if that, I guess the the mortality in that group is higher, but presumably the cardiac mortality would come down with that, with less restenosis. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Gary, well, Gary, thank you. I, I have a, so right. thank, thank you so, so much for joining us this morning. I think that was outstanding. And I think you, your, all your recommendations are taken very well. Um, on the topic of calcium, I wonder if you can talk a little bit, you know, obviously I, IVL, uh, intravascular lipid, sort of like the, the, new, the new technology nowadays. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the observations comparing what we see based on um, um, invasive imaging between atherectomy and um, IVL? Yeah, um, obviously you get more obvious calcium fracture with IVL. And it's a curious kind of calcium fracture because you see displacement of the calcium fracture or the calcium outward. So where you would have a solid arc of calcium, you don't with say rotational atherectomy plus balloon or CSI plus balloon, it just separates like here. But with IVL, I can't make my fingers do it, but it goes like this, bumps up and then back down. And it's, it's very, very curious. Um, we see that deep calcium really is not affected that much by IVL, but then it's not affected by any other technique either. Um, so the, the big difference is that um, IVL um, has a unique mechanism of how it causes calcium fracture. Um, you also sometimes see that with Late with eczema laser done in a contrast filled field, which does the same thing as IVL. It causes a little bomb to go off in the coronary artery. Um, but of course, with IVL, you don't reduce the amount of calcium. You with both a rotoblader and with 
um, CSI, you see that there is um, uh, deformation, if you will, or wire bias so that the spinning uh, crown or spinning burr uh, burrows into the calcium. And sometimes you actually get a figure of eight appearance where you get two parallel lumens um, with rotoblader and orbital atherectomy. Uh, because uh, it preferentially, such as wire bias, um, carves a, a, another path into the calcium. So is there any, any um, or is it your impression, I don't know, that there's any head-to-head -head comparisons, but no. do you think that the acute outcomes in terms of stent expansion are favored by, I, or at least those lesions that can be treated by IVL? I mean, there really isn't much data. There are a couple of uh, rotoblader CSI comparisons where, um, you know, one small study favors one, one small study favors the other, depending on what your bias is. Do you look at trauma? Do you look at stent expansion? But there's really no, nothing really decent. And the impression is that regardless of what you do, um, you get a better acute result. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Hey, Gary, this is Steve Fowl again. I have one other question for you. So, you know, for those of us whose careers were influenced by yourself and, and your partners, including Alexandra at uh, the hospital center, um, you know, you've been talking about this field for a long time. Um, what has been, what is the state currently of intravascular imaging in PCI in the U.S.? We, for a long time, it was the utilization was very low. Have you seen utilization pick up in any uh, substantive way? And, you know, over your career, I'm certain it's gone up, but I just wonder what our current use is and how that compares worldwide and if what you think the, uh, the standard should be. So um, the U.S. right now is about 15%, hasn't budged much. It's lower in Europe, about 5%. Korea and Japan are exceptions. Japan is about 90% nationally and Korea, it's a little hard to get a handle on the number, but it's probably in the 50 to 60% range. Um, everybody has an excuse why not to do it. Uh, some people point at the guidelines that it's not class one. Some people point at reimbursement. I think an overwhelming problem is education. I think most people have no idea what they're looking at and we refuse to admit it. Um, and the US distribution tends to be um, non-homogeneous in that you'll find institutions like ours, like Scripps Clinic, where the use is in the 80 to 90% range. And then you have people who refuse to take it off the shelf. Um, my impression is that very few interventionalists today admit to not using it. They all pretend to use it, right. but they simply don't. Um, and that's disturbing. Um, when it comes to education, we published a survey that we took where we asked individuals who were about to finish their interventional fellowship, whether they felt comfortable doing physiology, IVIS or OCT on their own. And when it came to the imaging component, only about 10 to 20% are properly trained. And if you look at the ACGME recommendations, they sort of just mention intravascular imaging. They don't provide any standards or even a statement that this has to be part of the curriculum. Um, now, some of it is that the cath lab directors and the attendings in the cath lab themselves don't use it, don't know how to use it, don't know how to teach, um, teach the images, and therefore they don't transmit the little that they do know to the fellows. But part of it is that the fellows get focused on stents and wires and balloons and crossing lesions and inflation techniques and so on and so forth. And it isn't until the day before they graduate that they say, whoops, what can you tell me about imaging? You've got 24 hours, which of course doesn't work. Um, it's not something that you can learn in a day. Uh, particularly if you get beyond anything as simple as vessel size and minimal stent area. And can you just expand on, thank you. And can you just expand on 
you uh, said earlier that everybody should be using HD IVUS. So, yeah. yeah. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, when it comes to mechanical, um, 40 megahertz is dead. So nobody should be using a 40 megahertz mechanical transducer. The resolution is higher with the, with the HD IVIS. The penetration is the same. Uh, there's no advantage that I know of unless the companies are willing to give away a 40 megahertz transducer. There's no advantage whatsoever for using 40 versus 60 megahertz transducer. There are a few countries where the 60 megahertz is not yet approved, but that's another story. Um, so mechanicals, you should be using HD IVIS. And uh, in the US, we have ASSIST, we have Boston Scientific, and we have Infraredics. They're all in this 55 to 60 megahertz range. The cost of the catheters is effectively the same. You go to Japan, you've got Terumo that uses 60 megahertz. The problem is what do you do with the Volcano Eagle Eye 20 megahertz? And it gives you adequate information in terms of uh, vessel sizing. If you do co-registration, it gives you okay, not great information in terms of stent length. Uh, and it tells you whether you've achieved decent expansion and whether you have a large plaque burden at the edge. So, so it's okay, um, but it is not my preference. And I've been hoping and I've been hearing for years that Volcano and now Philips are working on um, a higher frequency transducer for the synthetic aperture array. So there seems to be the promise of a higher definition transducer in the works. I do know of at least one startup company that has a 40 megahertz synthetic aperture array transducer that I saw a prototype at TCT and it is spectacular. Um, and I would guess, and I have to um, see this because it's not you know, intuitive that a 40 megahertz synthetic aperture ray transducer will come pretty close to a 60 megahertz mechanical. The reason being that the 60 megahertz mechanical has issues of flushing bubbles, NERD and so on, which are not present in a 40 megahertz um, synthetic aperture ray. Thanks. Can I ask, do you think the um, results of a trial like FAME 3 would be materially affected if we had mandated use of IVUS and certain IVUS criteria? I think the IVUS use in that trial was about 12%. And we've seen a lot of data that you showed of IVUS versus angiographic guided PCI. But what if we put, you know, IVUS guided optimal PCI up against bypass surgery? Yeah, I think bypass surgery would lose. You just, if you look at the statistics, if you do IVIS guidance, you're going to reduce the event rate in FAME 3 by half. The, prom the problem is that the FAME investigators don't want to hitch their wagon to IVIS or OCT stent optimization. The same thing, by the way, held true with, and this is, this is going to sound a little bit off, but um, the Abbott Absorb device. Abbott, absor Abbott said, don't use intravascular imaging. They went to Japan that does 90% image guided metallic scent implantation and say, now that you've got this brand new device that you've never used before, don't check your work with imaging. Um, because they did not want to have the, um, the scaffold linked to imaging, just like the FAME 3 investigators did not want to have um, uh, FFR guided uh, triple vessel intervention linked to stent optimization. Um, and the, the most of the people who do, or who are involved with the FAME studies are imaging nihilists. Um, and they categorically are imaging nihilists and they don't look at any data beyond what the FFR data shows. I have heard talk um, by people who looked at the FAME 3 data and said, mostly from Japan, and says, well, we should do a FAME 3 cabbage versus 
um, IVIS guided stenting FAME 3 trial in Japan. And I suspect that they're going to do that. Dr. Mitchell, there's a question in the chat box from uh, one of the uh, members of the audience. In the studies comparing IVIS to no IVIS uh, and geography only PCIs, uh, were there differences in terms of balloon sizes and pressures utilized? Yes, bigger and higher and, and longer. Stents are bigger, balloons are bigger, balloon pressures are higher, and stents are longer. Just what you would expect. Right. And um, another question is, can you elaborate on the standards for IVIS guided PCI and any recommended set of benchmarks that should be achieved with IVIS guided PCI? I'm not quite sure I understand. I think in terms of expansion, if you look at IVIS, either the IVIS XPL or the ultimate criteria, um, they have a minimal stent area greater than 90% of the distal reference lumen. Um, there are many ways of um, having a benchmark for stent expansion. One is just what I said, uh, the minimal stent area is larger than the distal reference lumen. Sometimes if the stent is very long, you divide the stent into two halves and you compare the proximal half minimal stent area to the proximal reference, the distal half minimal stent area to the distal reference. There are also some general uh, absolute minimal stent areas. Uh, they obviously cannot be achieved in small vessels, but if you have a, a, you know, at least a three millimeter vessel, you should be able to achieve a minimal stent area of at least 5.5. Um, Left main obviously should be larger. There's they're both the IVIS XPL criteria that we use in the US. And then we recently published a paper that addressed the specific question, what happens if the vessel is too small? What happens if you can't achieve ideal minimal stent area, your absolute minimal stent areas? And the metric that we came up with, at least in that study, is a minimal stent area compared to the EEM at that particular cross section of more than 40%. So again, if you can't get minimal stent areas that are adequate, you at least have to optimize expansion. And finally, you should have a plaque burden at the stent edge, approximately distally of less than 50% without a major dissection. And the OCT studies are about the same. You know, there, there's some minor differences, but not much. You know, if people sort of um, quibble about um, a half a millimeter here or, you know, lipid there or so on, but, but it's not. Are there any other comments or questions from the audience? Dr. Mintz, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank very you for much. inviting me. Thank you.